Nansen Petrosian, my colleague at Southampton, uh, topological spines, minimal realizations, and cohomology of strictly developable simple complexes of groups. Thank you. Uh, Ian, uh, thank you. Sorry, one more thing. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, if you are, I'm, I'm going to mute you all, but if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself. Uh, but uh, say who you are when you ask a question. Okay. So, so, sorry, uh, Nelson, we can't hear you. You, you are, you are mute. Sorry, I've muted him. I think. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to give this talk, uh, even though it's online. Um, yes, like which I wish I was in Toronto right now, but um, it's still nice to 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 give a give a talk about about this stuff. So um, whatever I'll say today is a joint work with uh, Tomas Portula, and all the pictures that you'll see in this talk are, are drawn by Tomas. Um, so um, let me just say what I'll talk about. So the outline is to give some motivation about the problems we're considering. Then they discuss the Davis complex in the setting of Coxeter groups and talk about the Bestina complex, which is analogous construction, and then discuss uh, generalizations and applications of these uh, methods. So let me start with uh, general problems that we're interested in. So let, B, uh, let G be a group that acts on a simple complex X with a strict fundamental domain K. So you might be interested in the following problem, equivalently deform X to Y, where Y is of smallest possible dimension. And uh, also, uh, what is the relationship between Bredon cohomology of X and the cohomology of the subcomplexes of K, which is the fundamental domain? And we'll see later that these two problems are very much connected. Now, in which setting you might be interested in this type of questions or problems, is for instance, when G is a Coxeter group and X is a Davis complex, or more generally when X is a building and G acts chamber transitively, or uh, more generally, you could have a, a CAD zero complex and G acting uh, on, on this complex. And I guess the most general setting that we can consider is when we have a, a space, uh, which is a model for a classifying space uh, which I denote by EFG, where F is uh, a family of subgroups. So since this classifying spaces will uh, come up again in the talk, uh, let me say a few words about them. So what is a classifying space for a family of subgroups? Let G be a discrete group and F be a family of subgroups. Uh, now, a model for a classifying space denoted by EFG is a GCW complex X such that each stabilizer is in F. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say what a family of subgroups uh, is. So a family of subgroups is a collection of subgroups of your given group, which is closed undertaking subgroups and uh, under conjugation. So we want each stabilizer to be in this family. And for every F in the family, the fixed point sets XF are contractible. Now, uh, these classifying spaces always exist. And uh, it's it be again important later on that any two models for a classifying space are G homotopy equivalents. Okay, uh, now there's a standard notation when F is the family of finite subgroups, it denotes the classifying space by E under bar when it's a family of virtually cyclic subgroups, then you denote it by E double on the bar. Now, um, here's a few examples. When uh, you have, a, for instance, two reflections on the real line, then they um, generate uh, infinite dihedral group, which acts on the real line properly. And the fixed point sets are, 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 are finite subgroups, so the reflections are points. 
So we do get a classifying space, uh, which is the real line for, um, for proper actions for this infinite dihedra group. And more generally, you could have a, a group which acts properly on a tree, in which case the tree itself will be a classifying space for proper actions for that group. Now, uh, when you have a group, uh, so even more generally, you could have a group which acts on a cat zero polyhedral complex, in which case we can say that the complex will be a classifying space for the family of stabilizers, so the smallest family containing the stabilizers. And that's because if you have a stabilizer subgroup, then the, its fixed point set will be contractible. Okay. So now uh, the goal uh, throughout the talk will be uh, to construct the minimal models for such classifying spaces. Uh, so where minimality could be minimal cell structure or, or dimension. So I think, the, I guess the main objective will be the dimension. And here we could mean the virtual cohomological dimension of the group G or more general, or, or uh, it could be Verdun cohomological dimension of the group G. So what is the Verdun cohomological dimension of a group? Well, that's just a generalization of ordinary group cohomology uh, Verdun cohomology is a generalization of ordinary group cohomology. So its uh, cohomological dimension is defined in a similar way. It's the highest dimension where you have non-trivial Verdun cohomology. Uh, by the way, can you see the slides okay so far? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, they're fine. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay, so let me continue. Now, these classifying spaces appear um, in um, some important conjectures. Um, so one place they appear are in this baum cones and Farrell-Jones conjectures. So in baum cones conjecture, they appear on the left. Here you can see the classifying space for proper actions. And in Farrell-Jones conjecture, uh, E double under bar appears on the left uh, as well. And uh, the nice thing about these conjectures is that if you have a class of groups for which you know the conjecture holds. For instance, uh, when you have a, a class of Coxeter groups, you know the conjectures hold, then you can um, do computations using uh, of the right side using the left side. And that's where the classifying spaces or nice models for classifying spaces come in. So you want classifying spaces with nice minimal cell structure that you can apply your methods like spectral uh, the Tia Hitzberg spectral sequence and, and whatnot. Okay, so um, let me recall the Davis complex for a Cox Tether group because we will need this later to define the Bestina complex. And let me just uh, restrict to right angle Cox Tether groups because it's just easier to visualize. So L will be a finite flag symbolical complex. And by a flag, uh, complex, we mean that if we have a face of a simplex, then a full simplex has to be part of our complex. And we have this correspondence with this flag complex. Uh, so we define the Coxeter group corresponding to the flag complex with the generators corresponding to the vertices and with the relation that the square of each generator is identity and the two generators commute if and only if they're connected by an edge. Well, here are some examples. So if we have a, if you have an n-dimensional simplex, then the corresponding Coxeter group is just z mod two to the n plus one. If there are disjoint points, then we get a free product. And more generally, if we have a joint of two flat complexes, then the corresponding Coxeter group is the direct products. And if we have a disjoint union of two flat complexes, then the corresponding Coxeter group is the free products of the Coxeter groups. Now uh, there's a Davis complex uh, for, for these uh, groups on which they act nicely. So uh, let me go back to the infinite dihedral group. That corresponds to the flag complex, which is just these two points. Now we can take the cone on this and we get uh, in two intervals joint at E. And these are the building blocks for, our, uh, for, the, for the Davis complex. And you just um, pull them in a, in a, in, a well, in this way, where you can form a real line. And then 
the, the infinite dihedral group will act by reflections on this real line. So what is the general construction? Well, for that, we need to look at subsets of our standard generating sets, which are called spherical. So they're called spherical if the group they generate the, is finite, a subgroup of the Coxeter group. And that by car correspondence, this happens if and only if these set of elements span a simplex in the flag complex. Now we take the pole set of spherical subsets of the uh, this set ordered by inclusion, and we also include the empty set, which corresponds to the trivial subgroup. Okay, so here's an example we have of these four generators. So this is a flag complex. Now the pole set, it can be visualized as uh, like this. So we have, for instance, S1 is uh, an element of the pole set and S1 comma S2, I just don't write the comma here. This is the sub is also uh, an element of the pole set and the arrow means that the pole set uh, relation, so inclusion of S1 into S1 comma S2. Here in this point, for instance, we have S1 comma S2 comma S3. And the realization of this pole set will be the cone on the biocentric subdivision of this complex. Now important, uh, well, this uh, realization has a very important structure, which is the mirror space structure, also called panel structure or um, stratified uh, structure, depending on literature. The mirrors are uh, the spaces Ks uh, for each element in the pole set. And they're defined as follows. So Ks is the sub pole set of our pole set consisting of elements S prime, where S prime is directly over S. So we have a relation S prime is greater than S. And for instance, Ks2, these are uh, elements which are, well, yeah, so we look at the pole set of elements which are directly over S2, so that it can be represented by the arrows coming out from S2. And whatever they span is our mirror, and that uh, is indicated in the, with the purple. So that's Ks2. And then we have Ks3, so all the arrows uh, coming from S3, and uh, we have Ks4 in color brown. Ks3, S4 is this one here. And finally, we have K0, which is the mirror corresponding to our minimal element, and that will just be the cone on this complex. So we have two characteristic properties of these mirrors that their union is the whole space. Uh, and when we intersect two mirrors, either it's empty or it's a mirror corresponding to a union of spherical subsets as long as that union is also spherical. So for instance, if we intersect the green and brown, we get the red and the red is, a mirror, is, is the mirror corresponding to S3, S4. Okay, so now equipped with this mirror structure, we can define the Davis complex. So we take our Coxeter group and multiple and, and multiple well, cross it with uh, our realization Q, and we mod out a certain equivalence relation, which is defined as follows. So W one X one is equivalent to W two X two if and only if X one equals to X two, and W one inverse W two is in the spherical subgroup which corresponds to the smallest mirror containing X1. So let me give you an example. Uh, we have the flat complex, which is the single edge. And so the corresponding coxeter, right angle coxeter group is at mod two cos at mod two. Then what uh, we have for realization is just a cone on the sub biocentric subdivision. So it's that here. Now we need to take four copies of this and glue them according to the equivalence relation and we, we do exactly this, right? So we glue them according to the equivalence relation and we get a, a square where we have our reflections S and T acting, yeah, horizontally, yeah, well, S and T acting by reflections horizontally and vertically. Okay, so um, with, 
this definition, it's easy to see how the Coxeter group acts on the Davis complex. It just acts on the left. So W acts here on the left. And the quotient is exactly uh, this uh, realization of set Q. Again, that's not difficult to see at all uh, using this definition. And you can also see that you have a section from this quotient back to your uh, Davis complex. Um, just taking the obvious uh, section. So once you have a section, you know that this quotient, uh, this space is a strict fundamental domain for your action. The stabilizers will be conjugates of spherical subgroups. So what we get is we get that uh, Coxeter group acts on the Davis complex properly and co-compactly. And in fact, by theorem of Musong, which says that uh, the Davis complex for any Coxeter group, not just right angle, supports a cat zero metric, we get that the uh, Davis complex becomes a classifying space for proper actions because we get that the fixed point sets for, for, for finite subgroups are contractible. Now the dimension of the Davis complex is always the dimension of the cone on, uh, on the subdivision of L. So it has to be a dimension always uh, L of L plus one. So for instance, if you take a single N simplex, then it's, its dimension, the, Davis, the dimension of the Davis complex will be N plus one. But we know that the corresponding right angle Coxeter group is just, is, is, is finite, is that much be N plus one. So, a point is actually uh, uh, also a classifying space for proper actions. So there is a, a difference, a big difference in dimension as n, n gets bigger. And so our goal uh, was to get models for, 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 for these uh, um, classifying spaces of, of minimal dimension. So Thomas and I showed that the Bestwina complex is uh, equivalently homotopy equivalence to the Davis complex. Now uh, you get automatically that the Bestina complex is, uh, is a classifying space because Davis complex is a classifying space. Now the, the no, he saw, I mean, the Bestina constructed Bestina complex uh, for acyclic uh, panels, but he showed that its dimension is always the dimension of the BCD of the Coxeter group. And Conchita Martinez Perez and Dieter de Creza showed that the BCD of the Coxeter group equals to a uh, homological dimension for proper action. So we do get that the, its dimension is minimal. So with the difference that we consider not exactly panels or mirrors we consider contractible ones. So we get that we get this discrepancy in dimension two that it could be that it may be, there are examples where homological dimension is two, but the dimension of Bestina complex is three. And the Bestina complex has a simpler cell structure in general than the Davis complex. Now, what is the idea? Well, in a Davis complex, in a basic construction, you take this mirror space and you cross it with the Coxeter group and you uh, mod out by equivalence relation. Well, that's a general construction. You can do it with any mirror space over Q. So you just replace, uh, you just replace this, this complex Q with a simpler mirror space, BW, and that's what Bestina does. So you define the, the complex with, with using, using this mirror space instead. So let me explain what Bestina complex is. But for that, I need to give you uh, a different definition of the, the Davis complex, which is the inductive definition. So, or, or inductive definition, sorry, for the fundamental domain of the, of the Davis complex. So uh, we start, start it's in step zero. For step zero, we take maximal elements in our pole sets and we take the mirrors to be points. So if you look at this example, uh, we considered the maximal elements in our pull set are uh, where there are no arrows coming out. So these are these two points here, there's no arrows coming out. And we just define, um, define uh, the uh, mirrors that to be these two points here. 
Now for inductive step, you say that given S in the, in, in the pole set, suppose that for all S prime directly over S, the panels have been defined. Then you define the panel for S, KS to be the cone on the existing panels with S being the cone point. So here is S4, it, directly above it, the panel has been defined. So you just cone it off and you get this blue line here. Now you can do that for uh, point S2, S3 because there is uh, one arrow coming out and there the panel has been defined. So you just cone it off and you just move on a similar way across and you just define, you just cone off these panels and you get the, um, the fundamental domain for the Davis complex. Now you do similar construction for a uh, Bestina complex. And inductive step is exactly the same. The induct, so, sorry, uh, the uh, initial step in the induct induction is exactly the same. You start with maximal elements uh, and you let their panels to be points. For the inductive step, uh, you, do the you do the following. So for given S in Q, suppose that for all S prime, which are directly over S, the panels have been defined. Then you define BS to be the smallest dimensional contractible polyhedron containing the existing panels. So what that means is that in the Davis complex, you, you had the existing panels, say a single edge and a point, you would cone them off. Whereas in a Bessina complex, when you have an edge and a point, you look at smallest contractible polyhedron containing them and you just connect them via an edge like this. So I guess a few remarks are here and are in order. Um, there is a unique way of constructing the Davis complex here inductively, but there is um, we have choices how to construct the Bessina complex. So instead of taking this edge here, I could have taken this edge instead. So there is some freedom of how you construct the Bessina complex. And uh, when we say taking the smallest dimensional contractible polyhedron containing this union there's really two things can happen. Either this space will have top dimensional non-zero integral cohomology. And so the best thing you can do is just cone it off to get something contractible, or it will not, it will have a trivial top dimensional integral cohomology, in which case you can embed it in the same dimensional contractible complex. And that's where you can lower dimension. I think in some constructions, you just basically, you have already contractible complex, so you just leave it, you don't do anything. We'll see examples of that. Okay, so let's run through the, the, this example with uh, the Coxeter group with four generators. So we start with uh, step zero, we have these two points. We don't, uh, we just define the panels to be points there. And then um, we have second to maximal one. Now, the, there the panel has been defined here over it. So what we do according to our inductive step is to uh, define a BS to be the smallest dimensional contractible polyhedron containing this point. Well, the smallest dimensional contractible polyhedron containing this point is just that point. So you just leave it alone, you don't do anything. And then you do the same thing for the other cases. And the next interesting case appears here. So um, let me get to that here for S3. For S3, you have everything above it has been defined. So you see that you have now these two disjoint points. So the best thing you can do is just to connect them via an edge. And then for the smallest element, you already have something contractible. So you leave it alone. You don't do anything. So you see that in this case, the Bessina complex is just a single edge and you are uh, lowering the dimension. So um, here's another nice example. So we have um, 
a flag complex, which, which is an edge, uh, single edge and a, and a single vertex, the corresponding coxeter, right angle coxeter group is Z mod two cross Z mod two with a free product of Z mod two. And the fundamental domain for the Davis complex is this, this here, whereas the Vesmina complex is just a single edge. So when you construct the Davis complex, what you get is just you get this nice picture with squares and uh, reflections. So these uh, two reflections here coming from the Klein 4 group are reflections vertically horizontally. And this reflection, you can think of it as this diagonal reflection here. Now for a Bestina complex, what you do is you replace this fundamental domain by a single edge and you get a tree. And that actually that's the best you can do because this group is actually a virtually free group. So we know that you know, it should have a classifying space uh, for proper actions, which is a tree. And actually this space deforms, uh, currently deforms to, 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 the, to this one. So um, that's some examples of the Bessina complex. Um, so the examples I've shown or, or the constructions were for um, proper actions and finite stabilizers. We have generalizations where we consider um, infinite stabilizers. And the general, the most general setting we're working in is in a simple complex of uh, complex of groups which are strictly developable. So let me recall what these are. So we always have a finite pole set. A simple complex of groups cons consists of collection of groups for each element in the pole set and uh, monomorphisms from PJ to PT. Uh, when we have j less than or equal to t in our uh, whole set relation, satisfying obvious compatibility conditions. Now, the fundamental group of the complex of groups is uh, denoted by g is the co-limit of the system. And if it turns out that we have an injection from our local groups pj to g, then this complex is said to be strictly developable. And this is suggested name. It means that we have this complex, we can construct this complex, um, which is the basic construction. So what we do is just very similar to what, how you construct the Davis or uh, Bestina complex. You take the group G and cross it with, with K and then you model by the equivalence relation. So um, for our purposes, it was important sometimes to consider a restriction on, these comp uh, on this complex. Um, so it was, we call it thin, which means that we can't have two adjacent local groups uh, being the same. So if we have two uh, adjacent uh, elements in the full set. So we have a relation between two elements, then the corresponding groups have to be different. Okay, so um, if you have a strictly developable thin simple complex of groups with fundamental uh, group G, uh, let F be the family generated by local groups. So it's just the smallest family containing this this, uh, this local groups PJ. Suppose this uh, um, basic construction is a model for a classifying space EFG, then the following are equivalents. It, so first, it equivalently deformation retracts onto the Bessina co uh, complex, which is a tree, if and only if Verdun cohomological dimension of the group uh, for the family of local subgroups is less than or equal to one, if and only if we have this condition, uh, cohomological condition coming from the boundaries of the panels. Now, um, this uh, result is, I guess, is a generalization of a result by uh, Mike Davis, where he's considering uh, coxeter groups on the Davis complex. And here, um, instead of cohomological dimension for um, for the family F, but on cohomological dimension, you consider the virtual cohomological dimension of the Coxeter group being 
uh, less than or equal to one. And um, it, I guess it's a special case of the following folklore conjecture that says that if you have a group and a family of subgroups, then the Verdun cohomological dimension is less than or equal to one, if and only if G acts on a tree with stabilizer generating F. So this conjecture is very much open. It's okay if when the family is the family of a, a just a trivial family, then it says that uh, it's just, it just reduces to the classical theorem of Stallings and Swan that groups of cohomological dimension um, less than or equal to one are uh, free. When the family is finite, then you uh, this holds by by the work of Don Woody. When, and then recently, uh, Dieter de Grese showed uh, verified this conjecture when F is the family of virtually cyclic subgroups. But other than that, the conjecture is very much open. Now. Um, another way we can um, generalize these results is, um, or apply these results is in the case of buildings uh, where we have a group which acts chamber transitively because they fit, well, they fit the bill of, of uh, simple complexes of groups. Um, so we have a group that acts chamber transitively on a building delta of type WS. Then uh, the existing realization we call B delta of the building delta such that B delta and the Davis realization B delta are G homotopy equivalents. Um, therefore, B delta becomes a classifying space for the family uh, of uh, parabolic subgroups. Secondly, we get this isomorphism between the Verdun cohomology of the group G with certain coefficients and this direct sum of cohomologies coming from boundaries of panels of the chamber. And uh, thirdly, we get this relation between um, cohomological dimension, Verdun cohomological dimension equals the dimension of the Bastina complex, which equals to the virtual cohomological dimension of the Coxeter group. Okay, so we always have this discrepancy that it could be that the Verdun cohomological dimension is two, but the um, Bessina complex has dimension three. Now, yeah, so now um, the step two is really the key here. Um, it's, we remember we are moving away from our proper actions uh, to our actions with uh, possibly infinite stabilizers. So we can't consider um, locally finite complexes so we can't use compactly supported cohomology. So we know that compactly supported cohomology is quite important. Many results like this use it to, sh to, to get, uh, to get uh, results about VCD of the group, but we just don't have, we can't use it here because we don't have locally finite complexes. But it turns out that Verdun cohomology is really the right tool, right, right uh, thing to use here you get, if you choose the right coefficients, you can get this isomorphism. Now, in generally, because we have a Bessina complex, we, uh, which is a classifying space, we get that Verdun cohomological dimension is less than or equal to the dimension of the Bessina complex. And now, uh, the dimension of the Bessina complex, by its construction, essentially, is the, it ha is the same as the VCD of the Coxeter group, for, uh, which is associated with this building. And it is the dimension where we have non-zero cohomology coming from these uh, boundaries of panels. Now, once we have that, once we, 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 we know that this is the case, then we know that if this right side is non-zero, that means that the left side is non-zero. Well, if the left side is non-zero, that means that actually, we can't have a strict inequality here. We have to have that dimension, uh, if the, the, these two dimensions are equal. Okay, so as a corollary of this, what you get is that if you have a virtually torsion-free group which acts on, on, on a building like this, then it's a VCD is always less than or equal to the VCD of the Coxeter group plus the maximal, maximum of the VCDs of the parabolic subgroups. Okay. 
Now, um, okay, so let me just say that this, uh, the, the um, complex of loops that we get here is thin. In other words, for, for in, the set, in this setting, it, it's similar to the um, right angle of Hoxeter group setting where we have the corresponding um, complex of groups with, uh, is thin, meaning that if you remember, two, if we have two elements in the pole set which are adjacent, then the corresponding local groups have to be different. Now, um, and it's, this is the case here as well. Now, this is a nice condition um, that we've used, but it may not be true in general. So uh, if we have we just take any general action with a sick fundamental domain on a, on a certain complex, it probably will not have the, uh, this, this property. So what you do, uh, can you do something there? And we can, but we have to be careful with our stabilizers. So here, let's assume that the stabilizers are finite. So suppose we have a group which acts properly on a cat zero polyhedral complex with a strict fundamental domain. And now let uh, Q to be the pole set of cells of K ordered by reverse inclusion. So its realization will be the first biocentric subdivision of K. Then we can actually give a formula for um, the down cohomology for proper actions in this setting. And it's just uh, this here. So it's a maximum of all, of all com relative cohomologies coming from panels and their boundaries. Uh, so one difference is that we don't, we, we don't look at no longer single element in Q, we, look at, we have to look at blocks in Q. So what is a block in Q? Well, here's an example. We, so here uh, the green, uh, it's highlighted in green. So we have a local group A, which is here, and a block is a connected, uh, a, a connected thing, which is, which ha where uh, all the local groups are the same. So here is another another block that they are different because there is no edge connecting these two, and uh, this uh, panel here, K K uh, prime C, is. Um, is in yellow. So we think of it as sort of the oriented uh, star of this green um, block. So it, it will have to, we will have to include this vertex, it will have to include this vertex, that vertex, and this vertex as well, and so the span of all these. And this will be the boundary, so we have to exclude the block, so the boundary will be just this vertex and and, and this, uh, this edge here, these two edges. Okay, but we have a finite complex. Uh, we just run through all these blocks and we get, we can compute um, this number here and that will give you actually the redone cohomology for proper actions. Okay, I think I have about 10 more minutes, is that right? Uh, yes, at least, yeah, yeah, 10 more minutes if you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so this this important this formula is, is is quite nice because we can actually apply it to to, to something else. Um, now, we can get new contraexamples to Brown's conjecture or the strong form of the Brown's conjecture. Um, so let F be a finite group admitting a reflection-like action on a compact connected flex and flexural complex of dimension n. Then you can form a semi-direct product uh, of the underlying Coxeter group with F. And uh, suppose that its top integral cohomology is zero. Then what you get is that the VCD of this group G is less than or equal to N. This is just follows from the fact that it's the VCD of the Coxeter group. And because you have top cohomology is zero, your VCD has, cannot be bigger than N. But we, you, what you also get is that Bredon cohomology for proper action is N plus one. So this is a, a contraexample to the strong form of Brown, Brown's conjecture or question that says that these two 
have to be the same. Okay. Um, right. So let me say what uh, a reflection like action is. So we, we call an action reflection like if it has a strict fundamental domain, Y, uh, which is uh, homeomorphic to an N ball. And ev every interior point of Y has the same stabilizer, call it F0. And F0 is a proper subgroup of the stabilizers of any point in the boundary of the ball. So what we really want is we want the setting, let me go back, we really want the setting of this formula here. So what we get then uh, from the construction is we get an N plus one ball, uh, which will be this space here and its boundary, well, well, this space will be exactly its boundary, which will be the N sphere. So we will have a contribution in dimension, non-trivial non contribution in dimension N plus one. So that's how we can get dimension to be N plus one. Um, well, can you have examples? What are some examples like this? and which are generally different than the existing ones. So we can actually found these not so long ago. Let me, let me say what they are. So you take a dihedral group of order 2n, dn acting on the 2n gone. Let's say n is odd. And let's color the, uh, the vertices here. Um, I guess, yeah, I want n here to be five, so we have midpoint so maybe it's yeah it's n gone with midpoints here so then i have um degree n map mapping the white vertices to this top vertex and the black vertices to the bottom vertex it's an equivariant map and it has a strict fundamental domain like this and the action is reflection like because you see here we have stabilizer which is trivial which is proper subgroup here for the boundaries. And this is homeomorphic to, uh, to this. Okay, now what you can do is you can form the more space. So use this attaching map to form a two dimensional more space, MZN1. And then you take N and M to be co prime. So you take your finite group to be a product of these two, inf these two dihedral groups, DN and DM. And you take L to be the flat complex to be, the, you know, the suitable subdivision of the product of these more spaces. And so what you get from here is that the corresponding group, which is the semi drag product of the coxeter group associated to this complex L uh, with F, will have virtual cohomological dimension four. So why is that? Well, because the virtual cohomological dimension of G is the same as of the Coxeter group. And now you see the top dimensional cohomology, a four dimensional cohomology here vanishes because they, these two kill each other. And so you get uh, VCD equal to four, but according to our theorem, you have a contribution in dimension five. So you get five dimensional, uh, redundant cohomological dimension would be five. So we get a difference in, in dimension. Yeah, I think uh, I'll just end with a few questions, open problems. So does Bestina complex support a gene variant head zero metric? Um, so we don't really know that, uh, we don't have really have examples of this. Um, if it always did, this is what would happen in this particular example. So if it did have a CAD0 uh, supported CAD0 metric, then we can look at the Davis complex associated to WL. Uh, then we look at the associated Bestina complex. It will be of dimension four. It will support a CAD0 metric. So what we will get is that this Coxeter group will be a four dimensional CAD0 group. But because of this dimension being five, its finite extension will be five dimensional CAD0 group. So we have an Again, a new example of groups where we have uh, the cat zero dimension of the group will go up if you go to finite extensions. And if we 
cannot put a CAT0 metric on, on, uh, on the Bessina complex for this coxeter group, then again, it will be at the first instance where we, that something like this cannot be done. So, and so that's uh, interesting in either way. And the second question is the Bestina complex equivalently deformation retracts onto the Davis complex. Well, we can only show this when uh, we have that uh, uh, in a setting where we have um, Redon cohomological dimension is at most one. We can defor equivalently deformation retract onto the tree, but we don't know this in general. Uh, even in the case of Coxeter groups, we can't. We, we don't know whether there exists a way of constructing the Sina complex so that it's always a deformation retraction. It will be, I mean, we show that it's a homotopy equivalence, a covariant homotopy equivalence, but not, not a deformation retraction, we don't know. And uh, what, so what can you do in a more general setting where you don't have a strict fundamental domain? And we haven't really thought about this and I think this is very hard, but we don't know. I think I'll stop here, thank you. Oh, great, well, uh, yeah, let's all the angels out and thank you.